history of uh, the Western world for the last 2,000 years is also a history of the symbiotic relationship of the Jews and the Christians, or the church and the Jews. And this is the historical uh, reality of Christianity, the acknowledgment of Christian origins in Judaism, and of course the reasons why uh, they separated and uh, Judaism became, in effect, uh, recognized but also uh, condemned uh, to an extent because in the view of Christianity, Jews had not accepted what Christians considered to be the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Now, there are certain elements in the relationship between Jews and Christians which were affected by other factors than religious conviction or uh, religious uh, understanding and belief. One of these factors is, from the very beginning, the national uh, hostility. Now, you know, when we read Greek and Roman writers before the Christian era, writers such as uh, Manetho the Egyptian, he was an Egyptian, a Greco-Egyptian, of the third century BC. Uh, Manetho is very hostile to the Jews. Uh, he is not a Christian. This is 250 years before the rise of Christianity, before the birth of Jesus. Uh, when we read and hear about uh, Ap Apion, Apion, a Greek, also from the city of Alexandria, uh, he was a Greek, not, he lived in Egypt, but he was, didn't consider himself an Egyptian. Uh, but Apion, uh, of the first century, he lived around the year 50, 40 or 50 of the Christian era. Appian was a Greek pagan, violently anti-Jewish. And uh, then we find in the writings of uh, Tacitus, the Roman historian, um, hostile attitudes or hostile expressions about the Jewish people. And in uh, Suetonius, and Suetonius wrote a very fascinating book, the, uh, the Lives of the Twelve Caesars, really an interesting book that all of you should read because it's, it's very exciting and fascinating. Now Suetonius, who lived around the year 100 or thereabouts, uh, when he observed the Jews and the Christians, he didn't see a difference between them because at that time in Rome, a Roman couldn't quite understand what this argument is all about. Uh, all he knew is if Jews and Christians are fighting and arguing and they're mentioned using the same vocabulary and both of them talking about the Messiah and uh, both of them talking about the end of days, it, he didn't know the difference between them. So he assumed that this Christ they were talking about was the ringleader or the rabble rouser who was making the Jews uh, go into riots. He didn't quite know the difference, and many Romans couldn't. But it's interesting that even Suetonius has a kind of supercilious attitude towards the Jews and looks down upon them. So there is a nationalistic element that is Greeks and Romans and Egyptians and Syrians and some Phoenicians. Many people were anti-Jewish because Nations don't always agree. I mean, you have wonderful examples uh, contemporary with our own time where people speak the same language and are ready to kill each other for uh, reasons uh, understood and perhaps not understood. But evidently, the Jews were a target of contempt by pagans. One of the reasons, and they say this, they actually express this, they can't understand this people they have a temple, they worship a god, and there's no statue, there's no picture, there's no physical representation, not even symbolic, of the object of their uh, worship and their adoration. So the fact that the Jews worshiped in what the pagans considered to be a very mis mysterious way was something that uh, not only aroused their curiosity, curiosity, but the whole concept of something's wrong with them. They don't quite understand how religion should be uh, observed. And then, um, so that is one of the factors, one of the elements, and that, by the way, persists throughout 
uh, Western history. Um, of course, at times it reached a very uh, terrible peak of hostility and hatred where the nationality of the dominant nation was so opposed to the foreign nationality of the Jews who lived among them that uh, it became a matter of uh, annihilation of a people. And this, by the way, happened periodically. It was not just the grand product of the 20th century, which was probably the worst in history. Now, um, there is another fact. Yes, sir? Oh. I think you forgot to say. <laughs> I'm the teacher of this course. My name is David Nyman. I'm Dr. Professor David Nyman. Uh, a little background, very little. Um, I taught for uh, many years at the Catholic universities, uh, at Boston College for 25 years, and at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. And last semester I taught at St. John's Seminary in Camarillo, and this year I'm this semester I'm teaching at Loyola Marymount. But I'm also teaching at the University of Judaism, and I have taught at Jewish universities also. Obviously, my background is Jewish history and Jewish religion, and uh, I've read extensively in Christian history. So I'm able to offer this course on the, the church and the Jews through the centuries. Yes? question about what you've said so yes. far? Yeah. Um, in addition to the Jews <clears throat> in, the, in, for instance, this Egyptian yeah. culture, yeah. were there other minority groups uh, that were extensive that were also discriminated against? Uh, or, or, or do you think the position of the Jews was unique? Uh, the position of the Jews is quite different because, first of all, the Jews constituted a significant nationality. Uh, we were rather ex large in numbers and proportionately very large in numbers in the ancient world. Uh, one of the um, tragedies and curiosities of history is that 2,000 years ago in the Roman Empire, we were 10% of the population. There were 8 million Jews in the Roman Empire out of a population of 80 million. And after 2,000 years, we're still only 15 million. So that is testimony to um, one of the um, sad parts of our history. Uh, in 1939, for example, there were 17 million Jews in the world. Uh, in 1945, there were only 11 million. So these things happened over the course of time. We don't know of this attitude expressed towards others, but you see, the Jews were a, a visible presence even in the Persian Empire in 450 BC, in the Book of Esther, where we see Haman speaking about the Jews as being a people who are different, observe laws which are different, and somehow they are a people who should be um, viewed with suspicion. I mean, that existed then, then too, for similar reasons. There was the nationalistic problem, and there was also the, the mystery of the Jewish approach to faith and religion. <coughs> And then we have another factor, and this works many times throughout the history of Europe, and that is what the Marxists would call the class struggle, where Jews, for various reasons and because of their condition, um, usually manage to establish themselves with a uh, sense of security, economic security, and uh, the uh, solid um, relationship of families and Jewish groups within any community. And in many, in the course of time, always from the beginning of history until the present day, <coughs> there is always a large proportion of a population which is poverty stricken. And uh, many times there are people who simply can't see their way to rise from their low economic status. And this at times leads to rebellions and to revolutions, and this has happened throughout history. And many times, especially since the rise of Christianity, the social revolution was diverted and directed against the Jews. They were a visible target, as we'll see. Yes? Uh, following up on the lady's question, yes. were there equally equal suspicions toward Mithraists and ISIS cults? We don't know, and I don't believe so. You see, the. There is another factor, we'll get to that. And first of all, Mithra, 
the Mithra cult and the Persian religions did become popular in the Persian, in the Roman Empire. Uh, the Egyptian uh, cults of Isis and Osiris also became popular to a certain extent in the Roman Empire. But you see, they, were, they are connected to their homelands. The Isis and Osiris religion is rooted in the Nile Valley. That's Egyptian. And Egypt was a land where the Egyptians lived. The Mithra cult is from Persia, and the Persians were in Persia, with the land where they lived. The Jews are different. The Jews in the Christian history are a diaspora nation, a very widespread diaspora nation. And this is another factor which is most important. Yes, sir? I just wanted to add that in the context of the Greco-Roman times, yes. the uh, culture of slavery was there, which did not make any distinction necessarily between uh, they were spoils of war. So slavery being a caste that uh. was uh, subculture, as yes. it were, that was, it was made up of not only, let's say, Jews, but many, many other nationalities, wherever the Rome conquered, that was the spoil. That is true. But there's also a difference between uh, slaves and Jewish slaves, other slaves and Jewish slaves. The Jews had a absolute, um, what they felt to be a divine commandment to redeem their brethren from slavery. So when Jews were taken captive and they sold into slavery, the Jewish community got together and they paid ransoms and they took them out and brought them into the Jewish community. And this has happened time and time again. The, the rescue of the Jewish people by their, uh, by their brothers. So that, uh, again, if uh, and we know that from many areas, uh, the, when the Romans uh, captured the uh, Slavs and brought them in as slaves, and by the way, the word slave comes from the, the name of the Slavic peoples, uh, they became slaves and they remained so. But uh, when Jews were taken captive and sold into slavery, they were usually sold in a place where there was a Jewish community. As we'll see, the diaspora plays a very significant role, both in the status of the Jew as well as in the presence of the Jews. Uh, let me just... Uh, Could you define diaspora? Yes, I will. I'm just going to explain. What is the significance of the fact that the Jews have been throughout most of their history a diaspora nation? If we date Jewish history, let's say, back to the days of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the period of the, of the Bible, so Jewish history, you could say, starting with Israelite period, is 3,500 years old. Out of 3,500 years, 2,500 years, we have been a diaspora nation. Now, what does that mean? A diaspora is the Greek word, which means the communities dispersed of a given nation. So you could say there is, for instance, there is an Armenian diaspora. A lot of Armenians live in California and in Boston. There is a land of Armenia, but there are Armenians not living in Armenia. They consider themselves Armenians. They also may be citizens of this country. There is a diaspora of millions of Chinese who don't live in China and still consider themselves Chinese. But there is a homeland of China. It's a vast country. There are diasporas of various kinds, but the Jewish diaspora is different in that for most of our history, we have been a diaspora nation with a very small population in the Jewish homeland in the land of Israel. And this was the result of the course of history, which I will clarify now. Um, when we read the Bible, the story of the land of Israel, the land kingdom of Judah, Two neighboring kingdoms, same religion, same language, same culture, same ancestry and traditions, but politically divided. After the death of Solomon, there was a rebellion. Northern Israel became independent. Southern Israel remained as Judah. <clears throat> These two states, then, are neighbors uh, for 200 years, from 922 to 722, 721. And during this period, there are uh, times there are enemies, at times they're friends, at times they're allies. It's an interesting history. It's all recorded in the Book of Kings in the Bible. The Assyrian Empire, when it started its march to world domination, in, 720, by, in 745, from 745 to 648, for 100 years, the Assyrians were always on the warpath trying to dominate the world. And they caused a lot of destruction. 
which they describe with pride, the number of people they killed and all of that, it's all recorded in the Syrian records. Now in 721 BC, they conquered the city of Samaria, the capital of northern Israel, and they deported most of the people of Samaria who were what we might call the potential political leadership. Well, let's say the king of uh, Israel and his cabinet and the generals and the, the educated people. These people were taken captive and they give the number, uh, something like 21,563 were taken captive from Samaria. And the biblical record tells us in the book of 2 Kings chapter 17, they were taken and they were deported to a great distance into Central Asia and settled in the lands of what are now Afghanistan and Armenia and Iran, out of the land of Israel. The Assyrian record says the same thing. And I deported these captives too, and he then he lists the lands and it's the same thing. So the northern Israel was politically destroyed a large part of its population deported into foreign lands, and we don't hear anything about them later on. But that doesn't mean that they disappeared, or, but they are the basis of a legend. A legend, by the way, which is purely fictional, the Ten Lost Tribes, you know, that legend, which plays an interesting role in history. But um, they were not Ten Lost Tribes that were sold or, or lost. These were remnants of the kingdom of Israel that no longer existed as a political entity, but its, its peoples were scattered. And later on we'll see how they were ultimately reincorporated into the Jewish people. Now, so that was an exile community. Then in 597 BC, Syrian Empire is already gone, and now the Babylonian Empire is conquered, and the Babylonian Empire came to Israel, or to the land of Judah, and besieged the city of Jerusalem and got the surrender in 597 BC. And as a result of that surrender, the Babylonian emperor Nebuchadnezzar appointed a member of the royal family to be king over Judah with a treaty saying, I will be loyal to the Babylonian emperor, signed by Zedekiah. And then he took the rest of the royal family and he took other people who are, you might say, nobility, and took them to Babylon as hostages or captives. Because they were the elements of the society that knew how to run a state and to organize a state, and they were brought en bloc to Babylon, and there they were settled, they were not scattered, they were simply brought to Babylon. And then, remarkably, the emperor, kind of neglected them, as if to say, don't go back to the land of Judah, but I'm not going to bother you. They organized themselves into a well-regulated community of about 30,000, you might say. Now, in 586, 11 years later, Nebuchadnezzar returned. And this time, he's going to punish the king because he tried to rebel. So in 586 BC, that's the destruction of the first temple. In 586 BC, Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was burned, a large number of Jerusalemites were taken captive, and now we could say that in Babylon there was a population of about 60,000 Jews. Don't make the mistake, which many people do, the Babylonian captivity, people will say, or they, they think the Babylonian captivity meant all the Jews of Israel were taken to Babylon. That's not what happened. I mean, when we read the biblical text, we'll see that's not what happened. He took the leadership and brought them to Babylon, including the royal family. Then he appointed a Jew to be governor of Judea, because you have to have somebody to organize the, even the, the, the destruction. So this man, Gedalia ben Achikam, was appointed governor. And uh, he was governing Judea. And he uh, remained governor for about two days, because there was still rebels. So he called a meeting of the cabinet, and they had killed him on the spot. Meaning what? They said, we will never submit to Babylonian authority. And what did they do then? Then they ran away to Egypt. But Israel was left rather devastated. But the people were still, people were still there, farmers, 
carpenters, whoever. I mean, people who were not leadership. The leadership was in Babylon. And then what happened to these 60,000 Jews in Babylon? They organized themselves, and not only did they organize themselves as a self-regulated community, because the Babylonians treated them with benign neglect. But not only that, they had symbols. They had the king of Israel, who had sat on the throne in Jerusalem, and he became king of the Jewish community. So they had the structure of government, and they had the intellectual elite, and they had the judges and the, the, those who knew the law, and so they organized the Jewish community in Babylonia. That community, you could say, was the first established diaspora community, namely a community of Jews living and thriving outside the land of Israel. How do we know that they were living and thriving and perfectly happy? Because 47 years later, you get these interesting uh, chronologies here, 586, uh, okay, fall of Jerusalem. Now, 539, Cyrus, in 539 BC, Cyrus the Great of Persia overran and conquered the Babylonian Empire, which means now Cyrus ruled from Persia all the way across to the Mediterranean Sea, including the land of Israel, which was part of the Babylonian Empire. Cyrus did not want a ruined and wrecked province in his empire. He wanted it to be rebuilt. And later on, we'll see that the policies of Cyrus were benevolent and brilliant on a large scale. So Cyrus conquers the Babylonian Empire and begins to issue decrees. And the decree of Cyrus states the following. You'll find it in the first chapter of the book of Ezra. Quote, the Lord God of heaven has commanded me to build his temple in Jerusalem, which is in the land of Judah. Therefore, I declare all Jews who wish to go and rebuild the land of Israel and the city of Jerusalem and the temple should do so. Next clause. But those Jews who don't want to go to rebuild the land of Israel should assist their fellow Jews and give them money and supplies and cattle and everything they need. Look what he did. He set up what we would call a Zionist movement, namely, Rebuild the land of Israel because God wants me to do it, meaning I want it rebuilt. Also identifying himself with the God of Israel. Not specifically, but saying in effect, the Lord God of heaven, which you, whom you worship in your own language, and I worship the Lord God of heaven, I, use, I speak Persian, so it's a different name. Do Persian sources say that, or is that just the, the Torah? The, uh, this is... This is you know, sometimes the language of a decree is indicative of its authenticity, but the Persian sources indicate that not exactly, not exactly the same words, but they indicate their, their concern with the rebuilding of the land of Israel. It's mentioned in Persian sources also. There are a few other things that appear both in biblical and Persian sources which seem to corroborate both. And you know, sometimes people say, I, I don't believe a biblical, this is, a, this is the view of many critics, I don't believe the Bible unless I have somebody else corroborating it, either a Greek or a, an Assyrian or a Babylonian. I say there are certain sections of the biblical text which corroborate the Assyrian texts because they are more honest. As you read them both, you can see. For example, Assyrian writers of history will write and and they will present the facts accurately, but they cannot ever bring themselves to say, we were defeated. They can't do that. They cannot do that. They were trained not to. So they will record the events, and you see that the king was not successful on this campaign. At the end, they will say, victoriously, he marched. They won't say backwards, but as you follow, the, you can see what was going on. Biblical writers, read chapter 17 of this book of 2 Kings. It says, we were defeated. We were absolutely devastated. We lost the war. I mean, 
biblical writers say it as it happened. And there are several cases where you see the biblical writers are telling you exactly what happened. And the Assyrian or the Egyptians are kind of moving around it to avoid the statement we were defeated. And one of the famous cases is Ramses II's invasion of Asia, the Battle of Kadesh. And his record states, when the Hittites attacked me, they caught me on all sides and they devastated my army and destroyed my army. But I, with the power of my God, escaped from the battlefield and came home, next, next sentence, to celebrate my great victory. <laughs> you do, I mean, there are certain approaches, you know. You're slaughtered and uh, you're defeated in, in a war, and then you come home and you, you, you declare victory. That happened to be the problem of Egyptian and Assyrian historiography. <laughs> We've, there were books written on that. Namely, this is the way they did it. Now, when you ask me if this statement is corroborated by the Persian records, it is in view of what the Persians did following this. I mean, we can see that the Persians were concerned with the rebuilding of Israel. So that the Declaration of Cyrus is fascinating, but I want to point to something in it. It, it shows that 47 years after the defeat of Israel and the destruction of Jerusalem, 47 years later, nearly two generations, the Jews living in Babylon are perfectly happy to stay there. They're prosperous, and so the emperor, who doesn't want to offend them, says, but those Jews who don't want to go, stay where you are, but please help those because I want Jerusalem rebuilt. It's a very clear statement. Now I'll give you another corroboration. There is a clay tablet called the Chronicle, the Babylonian Chronicle, in which we find the following text. Cyrus the Great of Persia says, Baal and Marduk, the gods of Babylon, have ordered me to rebuild their temples in Babylon. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to decorate them. And help. What is he saying? He's saying, look, every, all of you people be very, very content and, and uh, at ease. I will rebuild your temples. I want you to rebuild your temples. I worship your gods. I think you're very nice people. No problem. And then he did something else, and just to kind of put the point down on, because he's my hero. I mean, he's one of the greatest conquerors in history, but that common sense, not to offend the sensibilities of people. He declared, in this empire of 30 different provinces and uh, 20 different languages, every language is official. No one's going to force you to speak Persian. Everyone, come to court, speak your language, whether it's Arabic or Babylonian or Assyrian or Greek. That's accept, that is ex expected and that is accepted. Now look what he did. He spent probably less money on an army of translators and interpreters than he would have had to spend on an army of people to suppress the people and force them to speak Persian. Uh, talk about common sense. And by the way, all of the Persian emperors following Cyrus followed the same policy. And they, in, they write it into their documents. This particular decree is now published in all 30 languages of the empire. And in the Book of Esther, which is a good Persian document of 450 BC, every time the uh, decree is issued, it's issued in all the languages and in all the scripts of the empire. And we also find inscriptions on stone. If they happen to be in the West, they'll be in Greek and in Aramaic. They happen to be in Babylonian, they'll be in Babylonian and Aramaic and Hebrew and so on. So, after the Cyrus decree, we have a Jewish community in Babylonia, established, secure, prosperous. We also have a Jewish community in the land of Israel. Now, there's something about the Persian Empire which creates a situation that we as Americans can appreciate. But it's difficult for us sometimes to think back, could this have happened in antiquity? But it did. The Persian Empire extended from India to Egypt. I mean, Cyrus the Great ruled over Persia, Babylonia, Syria, everything from Iran to the Mediterranean Sea, and then India as well, at least that part of India, which is today Pakistan. Kashmir and so on. His son, Cambyses, then conquered Egypt in 522. 
So the Persian Empire extends from India to Ethiopia, the southern parts of Egypt. You'll find that expression many times in the book of Esther. Every time it mentions the extent of the empire or it mentions a decree which was published to all the provinces of the empire from India to Ethiopia. It is also apparent that there were Jewish communities established in the Persian Empire in 127 different urban centers. The word used in the Megillah is uh, Medinot, and we use the word Medina today in modern Hebrew as a state, but that's not what it meant then because according to the Persian documents there are 30 uh, gubernatorial regions in the empire called in Persian the Khashdarpani, and in Greek satrapy. Uh, the Greek word, the Persian satrap, means the governor, Persian governor of a province. There were 30 provinces in the Persian Empire. The Megillah of Esther says 127, and therefore I say Medinot in that document should be understood as urban centers. So now we have the picture that in the Persian Empire in 450 BC, there were 127 urban centers throughout the empire where Jewish communities existed. Where did these communities exist? Any place from India through Persia, Afghanistan, uh, Iran, all the way across to uh, the Greek provinces of the Aegean Sea, and uh, Assyria, Israel, down to Egypt, and to southern Egypt, a thousand miles south of Cairo, on the island of Elephantine, where the Jews constituted a uh, division of the Persian army. How do we know that? because the discoveries on the island of Elephantine have revealed a Jewish temple and 450 letters written in Hebrew and Jewish Aramaic which refer to the events the, of the time. <clears throat> and these letters refer to the fact that the Jews in Elephantine, which is by the way at the place where the Aswan Dam is now, about a thousand miles south of Cairo, the Jews there served in the uh, garrison or the army of the Persian Empire to preserve that particular area from invasion from the south. Now, how did the Jews come to be settled in 127 different towns all over the empire? Question. What was the Jewish population approximately at this time that you uh, I don't know. I really don't know. But uh, later on, we, we can estimate that the, the, at the peak of the Roman Empire, when there were 8 million Jews in the Roman Empire, there were probably the same number in the Persian Empire. So it was a substantial Jewish population. But at that time, we don't know. We have no figures. All we can say is 127 urban centers figure at the least 1,000 people living in a, in a town and Jews living in a town, and you have a, a guess number, a, a guess number. Now, why were there so many urban centers? Because, and this we know not only from uh, the Esther book, but we know it from Herodotus, the Greek historian who describes the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire was one political unit, and it was one political unit where people had freedom of movement. You can go wherever you want, no one will stop you. Not only that, as Herodotus explains, the roads throughout the empire were patrolled, for safety, the communications in the empire were as excellent and as rapid as possible. They, by the way, had the original Pony Express, which is described by Herodotus in detail, so that royal mail never stopped moving. If they sent a letter from Babylon, for, if they sent a letter from Babylon to uh, Hamadan, which was the northern capital, um, that letter in a bag never stopped moving. What, what stopped was the rider and the horse. So the rider and the horse would take the bags and run from one station to the next, probably six or eight hours. Then the rider and the horse would get off and rest, and the bags would go on to the next horse, and the rider kept moving. So the Pony Express was established by the Persians, and Herodotus very poetically says, and these couriers, neither wind nor rain nor sleet nor gloom of night would hinder these uh, couriers from the completion of their rounds. I mean, that's the beautiful 
uh, description of uh, the uh, efficient mail, which is, by the way, carved on the New York and uh, the post office in New York. <laughs> that quotation from Herodotus. By the way, that Pony Express is mentioned in the Book of Esther several times, because every time the, they issue a decree, they say, Vaharatsim Yatsu, the runners ran. They took the message and they started distributing it over the empire. It was a very well organized empire, and the proof of it is, I don't have to get literal proof, I can just get historical proof. The Persian Empire flourished for 200 years over an area which was larger, larger than continental United States. I mean, from India to Ethiopia and from the Black Sea to the Southern Arabia is well over 4 million square miles, much larger than continental United States, and this flourished for 200 years. With these humane policies, freedom of religion, freedom of language, recognition of everybody's culture, this was policy of the Persians. And then, of course, they, they exerted their strength, and there were no rivals. And the only problem they had was with the Greeks at the far western end, and then the two Persian wars, the Greeks in 490 and in 480 BC. The Greeks won their battles, and they became uh, independent, at least in mainland Greece, although Western Asia Minor still had a large Greek population, which was part of the Persian Empire. But if you look at the map, when the Greeks became independent, it was like, this little piece is cut off, okay? The rest of the empire is still there. But um, so, of the 20 or 30 nations in the empire, there seemed to be harmony, and we know that the Jews were always loyal to the Persian emperors, and the Phoenicians, who had the biggest fleet in the world, were loyal allies of the Persians. Namely, they were a part of the Persian Empire, and they were the fleet that fought the Greeks in the, these two battles. The Greeks happened to defeat them. Now, these, four, these 127 urban centers, 127 locations of Jews all over the Persian Empire, that is a diaspora. The Jews are a nation, and by the way, governed by Jewish law, and therefore they have one legal system which governs the Jewish people, and they are bound together by a cultural unity. So while the Jews are speaking Persian and uh, Aramaic and Babylonian and uh, Arabic and whatever other language they are, are speaking, they're always they always have Hebrew as part of their cultural heritage, which they are able to read and to write and to speak also. And that is uh, another fascinating feature of Jewish history in general, that from the beginning to the present day, Hebrew has always been a living language. This nonsense that the Hebrew was dead and was revived in the 19th century is not true. It was always a living language. What Eliezer ben Yehuda did in the 20th century when he wanted to make Hebrew the spoken language of Israel, is to revive it as a spoken modern language in the 20th century. Because when you read documents written in the medieval period, it is a living language. It's not, just, it's not devoted just to rabbinical decrees and to religious laws. Yes? In the Persian Empire, yeah. did the Jews of that day sacrifice outside the Jews? That is, had the, the prohibition against sacrifice other than if the Jerusalem temple existed yet, did they practice a sacrificial religion, or had they been developing a rabbinical religion? No. By that time? During the Persian Empire, the, 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 the temple was rebuilt in Jerusalem during the Persian Empire, and it served as the temple of the Jews where they offered sacrifices according to the biblical laws. The ones in Babylon, they're too far away. No, no, no. There were no temples outside of Jerusalem except for the temple in Elephantine in Egypt, which we suspect was a temple with the same ceremonies as the one in Jerusalem. Except for that one, it was the temple in Jerusalem, and the Jews from all over the empire would go to uh, Jerusalem on pilgrimage if they chose to or if they could. Depends on if you lived close by, you went to uh, Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot. If you lived uh, a little distance away, you went for once a year for Pesach. You know, the story of uh, the father of the prophet Samuel, who used to go to uh, the temple in Shiloh once a year because he lived at a distance. 
So some Jews went once a year, some went three times a year, and some went once in 10 years, depending on if they lived in India, they didn't go, <laughs> except maybe rarely. But uh, those who lived in Persia and Babylonia, they would make the journey to Jerusalem. So, but there was the one temple, and it was a unified, one religious community. Hebrew was the language of the Jewish nation. Uh, depending, on, Hebrew was the language of the Jewish nation in general, but of course they used their local languages as well. Look, I want to tell you something. In America, we have a notion that a synagogue is a temple. That is not so. The synagogue is the place where you come to pray, to teach, to study, and to call the community together to raise uh, riots or whatever you want to do, or raise funds or, or object. The word temple was adopted by the German Jews who started Reform Judaism 150 years ago because they said, we no longer believe in the restoration of the land of Israel. We are now Germans of the Mosaic persuasion and the temple in Israel will, will not be rebuilt as far as we're concerned. So this synagogue we will call temple. And so in the United States you have, uh, you have conservative and even orthodox synagogues called Temple Emmanuel or Temple Beth Hillel or Temple Beth Zion. It's not a temple. It's a, it's, in Jewish law it is a synagogue. It's a Bet HaKnesset. That's all it is. The temple, when we speak of the temple where you offer sacrifices on an altar, that exists in Jerusalem. Only. Only. Are we sure? What did they do in Babylon? Did they have a rabbinical tradition? And uh, tradition? Uh, I, I, will, I will clarify that too. What they had in Babylon was a Jewish community with um, lawyers and judges who judged according to Jewish law. And uh, the rabbis of the period of the Talmud and down to the 19th century, the 20th century, the rabbis are not what we consider clergymen. The rabbis were lawyers and judges. Their function was to govern the Jewish community. And they were rabbis by virtue of their knowledge of the law. I mean, you read the whole, in all the Talmud, students came and they studied law in the centers where there were Jewish schools of law. They attended the courts, they followed lawyers around, they observed them, they learned law by practical practice, by practice. And at a certain point, they may have been invited to try a case. And if they were found to be competent, they would be invited to try other cases. And then they might be given the recognition of the title of Rav. And then at a certain point, the community might say, you know, this guy should be a judge. So it was a growth in the knowledge of the law which ultimately led to the building of a body of um, legal scholars who governed the Jewish community. And by the way, the Jewish government, self-government, was a government that was essentially um, a jurisprudence government, a, a judicial government. They governed themselves by virtue of the law as they interpreted it under given conditions and changing conditions. And what is interesting is to see how Jewish law incorporates elements of Babylonian law because they're living in Babylon. Jewish law in Jerusalem is different. That's why the two Talmuds that emerge, the Babylonian Talmud and the, and the Palestinian Talmud, are different in many ways because they're different with dealing with different geographical conditions. Now, the Jews then created a diaspora. How was the Jewish diaspora created? By voluntary movement. Why did, it become, why did the Jews create a diaspora? Because they were living in Babylon, and then they went to Persia because the royal palace, the imperial palace, was also in Persia. And by the way, the, the Persian emperors had three palaces. Um, the summer palace was in the north, in a place called Hamadan, which is near Tehran. Why? Because there it is cool in the summer. You go to the mountains. The Winter Palace was in Shushan, which is down near the seashore, near the Persian Gulf. Why? Because it's warm in winter. Hey, a king has to live where it's comfortable. So you take your government with you. 
In the summer you go to Hamadan, in the winter you go to Shushan, and in the spring and the fall you stay in Babylon because that's the center of commerce and industry and the whole movement of, of uh, business all over the world. So you have three capitals, Babylon in spring and, and fall, and Shushan in winter, and Hamadan in summer, and that's the way it goes. I mean, you know, today, of course, the, the president can uh, just fly to Cape Cod or to, what is it, uh, Harry Truman used to go to Key West, and, uh, and uh, Eisenhower used to go to Denver, Colorado. I mean, you go where it's easy for you to run the government. So if you don't have air conditioning, you go where it's cool. Now, the Persian emperors had three capitals, and uh, the Jews went to these capitals because there were opportunities and such opportunities that Jews became members of the imperial cabinet. The book of Nehemiah in the Bible was written by a member of the imperial cabinet. And he describes the problem. The emperor said, build Jerusalem. And the Jews went and they started to build Jerusalem and the temple and they were having trouble, as we always do. And they were being helped by the Jews in Babylon, but they were still having trouble. So the emperor said, what's going on? Why isn't the progress going as we want it to? Nehemiah is a member of his cabinet. From the description, he might have been prime minister, but he was high up in the cabinet. So Nehemiah looks at the emperor and says, look, if you want me to, I'll go there. You know, I'll leave my position in the cabinet, and I'll go there with authority. And in two years, I'll see if I can clean up the mess and get things going. So the emperor says, OK, go, and I'll make you governor of the provinces. And so Nehemiah went there for two years, but he stayed 14, because things don't go so quickly, you know. And there are problems. And there were other peoples living in the area who said, we don't want the Jews to build their temple. You know, we replaced them. Now we don't want them to come back. We've heard that. So these were the things that were going on. But Jews moved because they had freedom of opportunity. Therefore. The diaspora of the Jewish nation was created by the Jews in an atmosphere of freedom of movement and of opportunity. So if you hear that it's possible to do business in China, then you try to establish a caravan route. So you can buy silk in China and tea, whatever else you want, and bring it back to the West. And so Jews moved in all directions. Uh, the Megillah doesn't mention that they had a community there, but it does mention the communities in India. And I believe that the Jewish community in China was established later, but there was one, a Chinese Jewish community, which flourished until comparatively recent times. Yes? Kaifeng was the capital, and there was a Jewish community in Kaifeng. Kaifeng is uh, of a later period, medieval period. I believe that the Kaifeng Jewish community was established in China probably um, during the Roman period, and when the Jews of Babylon and Iran started to establish a, a trans-Asian route, and they came there, and they wanted to buy silk to sell in the West. And the Chinese said, well, you're foreigners. You can't live in the Forbidden City. But we'll give you another place to live. And so south of Beijing is Kaifeng, and that's where they established the Jewish community. And they flourished for centuries. And uh, actually, the decline of the Jewish community of Kaifeng was caused by the Portuguese sailing around Africa, <laughs> the whole thing. All right. But that has nothing to do with the Persian period. All we know is that in the course of centuries, Jewish communities were established all over Asia and eventually we'll see in Europe as well. Now, uh, let's skip to the uh, later period and simply see how the Jewish communities of the West came into existence. And that happened as a result of the growth of the Roman Empire. The first Jewish community, substantial Jewish community in the West was the Jewish community of the city of Alexandria, Egypt. Alexander the Great, in his sweep through the uh, Near and Middle East, uh, in a brief period of time, exerted, con established control over Egypt, the entire Middle East, and uh, went down into India. Then he turned around and came back and wanted to establish his world empire with the capital in Babylon, which was the natural place. Uh, but he established the city of Alexandria in Egypt. 
That is, he drew the plans, he told his architects, get to work, and they started to build the city. Uh, Alexandria in 328 BC, when he came there, was just a fishing village, nothing. 75 years later, it was the greatest Greek city in the world. It had just exploded and boomed. And when it is at this great period of 250 BC, 75 years after Alexander the Great, and it is a flourishing city, a very interesting phenomenon. It is a Greek city, and one third of its population is Jewish. So you see, then again, you don't need, you don't need a corroborating document. All you say is you look at these phenomena and try to explain the difference. Why is it that within 78 years or 75 years, it had grown to be such a great city and had such a large proportion of Jews among its population? And the answer can only be a simple, logical explanation of the fact that since Alexandria became a great, booming commercial center, it attracted population in large numbers. And if it was booming, and so was the capital of the Greek Empire in Asia, with its capital at Antioch on the northern Mediterranean shores in northern Syria, people moved into these cities because this was the economic boom town. These were the economic boom towns. There were several of them. Alexandria happened to be the big one. And Jews migrated, moved from Israel and probably from Babylonia as well. As the, um, as the center of gravity of the economy moved into the West, people followed. And so there was this Jewish population in all the Greek cities around the Eastern Mediterranean world, and they were a substantial portion of the population, 20, 25%, 30%, and so on. Yes? How do you know that, that one-third of Alexander? Oh, because the ancient writers mention it. The ancient writers who lived there, they mentioned this in their histories. Oh, of course they said. Census, a census of population has been going on since, since populations were established in cities. I mean, King David made a population census of Israel, which the Jews thought was a terrible thing to do. But anyway, he did. It becomes a superstition. You're not allowed to count Jews, you know. Yes. So this diaspora did not come because of persecution. No. Modern no. This was no. Free. No, as a matter of fact, the diaspora arose voluntarily. It was not caused by persecution. It has nothing to do with modern times. We're dealing with a different situation because starting in the Middle Ages, we begin to have large migrations caused by persecution. But that's not what caused the diaspora. That's not what brought up about the diaspora. Um, now, Alexandria then is a great uh, Greek city with a large Jewish population. And the Jews of Alexandria, by the year 250 BC, had already acculturated to a large extent. That is, they were not Greek speaking. They were not Hebrew speaking. And that's why they needed a translation of the Bible. And so the Bible was translated into Greek. The first time the Bible was translated into a language other than Hebrew. So the Bible was translated into Greek around 250 BC. The Septuagint translation. translation of the Bible, and scholars usually refer to it as Roman numeral 70. Okay. It's a separate translation. It's in Greek, and it has certain features which indicate the prejudice of the translators, because every time you translate something, you betray it somehow. So there are certain things in it which betray, which show what the translators were trying to do, and that's revealed also in a letter which was written about that time, a letter called the Letter of Aristeas, written about 200 BC, in which he describes how the Bible came to be translated. And this is the story he tells. It's interesting that this is the story he tells, and, uh, and with variations that appears in the Talmud. He says, the emperor Ptolemy Philadelphus II. Now, when Alexander conquered his empire, I told you he tried to make a world empire capital in Babylon, and now it's going to be a Hellenistic empire, with the whole world being dominated by Greek civilization. He was not being, you know, he was not being uh, compulsory about it. He just felt that if I establish Greek cities all over the empire, and he established 31 Greek cities, 
They would be centers for the, for the dissemination of Greek civilization, and the people would become to begin to speak Greek and it would create a world which would take advantage and enjoy the benefits of Greek science and philosophy and culture and so on. Alexander the Great, by the way, was not just a conqueror, and he was very competent there, but he was also a, a young man with quite a philosophical concept and ideas, and he thought he was going to create, he thought he would create what he called homonoia, homonoiete, that is one humanity, all peoples, all nations bound together into one cultural entity. Nice ideas, he had idealistic ideas. But at the peak of this whole thing, and he was trying to really unite the world, um, fever, four days in pain, and died. He died at the peak of this whole thing at the age of 33, after he had done all of this. Now, um, without the going into the problems and the details, what do we do now? Uh, the generals divided the empire among themselves. So Seleucus took uh, control of Asia, and Ptolemy, one of the generals, took control of Egypt, and he had Israel as part of his empire. Ptolemy I, then, who called himself the savior, was the one who established the Ptolemaic Empire of Egypt, which was Egypt ruled by a Greek ruler. Seleucus established the Seleucid Empire of Western Asia, uh, an empire of Phoenicians and Babylonians and Assyrians and Armenians and Arabs and Persians, ruled by a Greek. Now you see the potential problem there of a foreigner ruling. But all of these men also created their centers, their Greek centers, the capital cities. So Ptolemy I was the one who organized the empire. Ptol by the way, Seleucus, interestingly enough, when he established his empire 10 years after the death of Alexander the Great, said, we're starting a new era, a new age, and this is the year one. So 311 BC is the year one of the Seleucid era. And by the way, that era was used for many centuries as the number of the year. Before that, we don't have that kind of universal era. But he established, and of course, later on, it was changed by the Christians. Yes? When the diaspora began to evolve, I think you talked about that the population, the Jewish population, did not really increase, or did it increase? I, I don't think I said anything about it. <laughs> I thought you said that from Cy uh, Cyrus to when uh, uh, Alexander the Great took over, the, the population was a no, no. Uh, what, I, uh, what I said, I, I don't remember saying it was about the same. I said we don't know the population of the Jews at that time. But all I'm saying is that uh, from the death of Alexander to the rise of uh, Alexandria, there was a tremendous growth in Jewish population, which is apparent in the fact that there were so many Jews living in the Greek cities, including hundreds of thousands in Alexandria. We don't know the exact population, but it, it was hundreds of thousands of Greeks living in Alexandria, of which one-third were Jews. So that's all we can say. And we have no other uh, bases on which to base a number of population. Now, Ptolemy II, who called himself Philadelphus, Ptolemy II, Philadelphus, man of brotherly love, was um, emperor of a very wealthy empire, because this, the growth of these cities was an economic boom. And he was very rich, and his empire was rich, and he, he exported the products of Egypt, which were uh, wheat and oil and uh, other products of the agricultural wealth of Egypt. And there was trade between Greece and uh, Egypt and uh, Syria. The Eastern Mediterranean was just crisscrossed with merchant vessels, and both of the empires became rich. But Ptolemy had an ambition. Ptolemy II had an ambition. His ambition was to create in Alexandria the greatest Greek city in the world. And he did it by supplying what is essential. He asked, he actually sent letters. Any Greek artist, philosopher, sculptor, painter, musician, come to Alexandria and everything will be given that you need. And what did he do? He gave money gave money, and give money, they come. Uh, and they did come in large numbers. 
And in Alexandria, he happened to build the greatest Greek cultural center. So by the year 250 BC, it was the center of Greek civilization and culture on a large and high scale. There were also, uh, so there were Greeks there, but there were also non-Greeks who were Greek speaking and who began to express their ideas in the Greek language. And this is what we call the Hellenistic culture. You know, Hellenic culture, or Greek culture is Athens up to the time of Alexander the Great. After this, you have a lot of non-Greeks who are participating in Greek culture. And incidentally, two of the most influential Greek writers in the Greek language of the first century, two of the most influential, happened to be Jews who wrote in the Greek language. And they were Philo of Alexandria and St. Paul. I mean, their writings in Greek, these were Jews, they <laughs> changed the thinking process of the world, of the Western world. But it's interesting because they were Hellenistic. They were not Greeks, they were Jews. But they wrote in Greek and they, they were fluent in Greek. So the story told by um, uh, the letter of Aristeas, he says, the king wanted to have the largest library in the world. And Alexandria did build probably the largest library in the Greek world. They say that at its peak, it may have had 500,000 books, manuscripts, because every book was a manuscript. And he says, and in the library, he had a section of laws. And he decided he wants the laws of all the nations in the library. So he asked the Jews for a copy of their laws. So they said, the laws are in the Torah. The Torah is in Hebrew. But we'll ask the high priest of Jerusalem to authorize a translation. And so the Bible was translated by these 70 scholars. And uh, I suppose the Jews gave him a very fancy copy, bound in leather and gold and all that. And he, the king, accepted it and put it in his library. That's the story told by Aristeas. The true story is probably that, yes, they might have done that. But the fact is the Jews of Alexandria needed the Bible in Greek because this was their language. So that is the uh, extent to which Jewish life had expanded. And now it was growing in the Western world, in the Greek world. I'm going to skip a couple of centuries to the Roman Empire. When the Roman Empire took over control of the entire Mediterranean world, and by the way, the Romans supported Jewish, Judah Maccabee in his rebellion against the Greek emperor of Asia. Uh, that is, they gave him diplomatic support. And they did give the Jews a, a mutual defense pact. So the Romans then sent a letter to the Greek emperor of Asia saying, we are friends of the Jewish people. And if you're going to attack them, bear in mind that we are going to come to their defense. That is the extent to which the Romans participated. It was just a diplomatic note, but it was enough. The rebellion of the Maccabees against the Greek emperor of Asia was successful, and the Jews established an independent state of Israel under the Hasmonean dynasty. But it only lasted for less than 100 years, because then the Romans came in and made Judea a province of the empire. But when they established diplomatic relations with Judah Maccabee, they established an Israeli embassy in Rome. And that was in 161 BC. And so in 161 BC, there was a Jewish community in Rome. And that community grew. And there was a steady migration of Jews into Italy and into Rome and into other parts of the Roman Empire. Why did they migrate? Because Rome was now becoming the master of the world, and the capital of the city was growing, and it was a land of opportunity, and there was freedom of movement. And so a, a steady migration of Jews began into Europe. And then as the Romans began to conquer northern Europe and western Europe, and Julius Caesar's conquest, you know, Gaul, all, he conquered all of Gaul and the Rhineland and, uh, and parts of Spain and England. As Julius Caesar was marching, <coughs> Jews were coming along in his army and also as merchants to supply the armies. So by the year 50 BC, and we know this from many records, Greek records, authors, Cicero mentions it in his orations, 
By 50 BC, there are Jewish communities established all over the Roman Empire from Alexandria, Egypt to London and to the Atlantic Ocean and to Spain. And these are mentioned in many sources. I mean, St. Paul says in his letter to the Romans, um, I would like to visit the communities in Spain if I have time. He never got there, but the point is, when he says the communities in Spain, we realize that these were Jewish communities because at the time of St. Paul, Christianity was beginning to grow within the synagogues and then breaking away to form their own form of Judaism, which ultimately evolved into Christianity. But um, these references, the uh, orations of Cicero, the letters of St. Paul, uh, the writings of Josephus, um, and especially the oration, the, the, the uh, speech made by King Agrippa, the last king of Judea, to the Jews of Jerusalem saying, do not rebel against the Romans, but it's a, it's a long and very eloquent speech. Uh, that re also says, you know, we have Jewish communities all over the Roman Empire from one end to the other, and why should you jeopardize their condition and situation by making war against the Romans? Uh, he, he felt that uh, a rebellion of the Jews of Judea against the Romans would harm the Jews in other parts of the empire. Actually, it didn't. The Romans in the first war, in the year 66 to 73, in that war which resulted in the destruction of the temple, in that war, the Romans were fighting to suppress a rebellion of a rebellious group in a province. No harm befell the Jews in other parts of the empire. There was no anti-Jewish hostility in general in the pagan Roman Empire. There was this kind of what I would call the gentleman's agreement hostility, namely that which is displayed by Suetonius and Tacitus, a kind of looking down upon the Jews as stupid people or silly people or something. But um, no, Jews didn't suffer in the Roman Empire as a result of the war in Judea. The second rebellion is a different story. Now, therefore, one thing you should bear in mind, and that is, the diaspora of the Jewish people, which extended around the world, or at least from India to the Atlantic Ocean, over Western Asia and all of Europe, that diaspora was established by Jewish communities voluntarily. They went there because they wanted to, they had opportunity, and by the way, when the Roman armies were moving north, you know, these were armies, they didn't have uh, planes bringing in PXs and bringing in the supermarkets. They, there were just armies moving and taking whatever they could. And once they established themselves in colonies, then merchants began to move out of Italy to bring them goods and stuff which they could buy. And among these merchants, a significant proportion were Jews for a very important reason. You have a question? No. Uh, they were a very important reason. You see, if the Romans were saying, look, we have armies up there and they need stuff, why don't you merchants go and bring your stuff there? You'll make four times the profit because you have to make the journey. Well, more Jews went than native Italians because the Jews were already psychologically once removed. In other words, they were immigrants and they figured, well, let's make another move. And so they went in larger numbers. In the city of Colonia, that is the great Colonia Agrippinensis, the Roman colony in northern, on the Rhine River, which became the city of Cologne, which is Cologne in French and Köln in German, the city of Cologne. That was a Roman colony established around 50 BC, or a little earlier, and the Jews were a significant proportion of its Roman population. And we know that also from inscriptions and also from recent excavations which were made in Cologne, which revealed so many interesting things, a synagogue and a mikveh. You know what a mikveh is, and uh, other things which show that there was a thriving Jewish community there. So that is the nature of the Jewish diaspora. That is how it was established. It was not caused by an expulsion of the Jews from the land of Israel, which is a standard piece of misinformation which appears in many history books, unfortunately. That when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in the year 70 and destroyed the temple, they drove the Jews out and the Jews were dispersed. That is not what happened. Yes, sir. Between 721, you say, with the Assyrians and the Nebuchadnezzar, where there were 60,000 dispersed yeah. to three countries originally. Yeah. What's the question? No, no, the, the, 
those exiles who were taken in 721 BC were forcibly deported. Those Jews who were taken out of Jerusalem in the year 586 BC were forcibly deported. But after that, after 539, they could all have gone back to Israel if they wanted to. So after 539 BC, all Jewish colonies outside the land of Israel are voluntary. Nobody's forcing them. I mean, the Emperor Cyrus said, you go back and rebuild Jerusalem and go back to the land of Israel. But if you don't want to, then, you know, God bless you. Do whatever you want, but please help me to rebuild Israel. That's all he says. So after that, it's all voluntary. And the only exile which is compulsory is the one that was established after the church became the official religion of the Roman Empire. We'll get to that. You were saying an exception on the Bar Kokhba revolt. I think you, you Yeah, yeah, the Bar Kokhba rebellion was, not, was a rebellion um, of the Jews against the Roman emperor because the Roman emperor had turned not against the rebellious province but against Judaism as a religion. And here we have, of course, the... Uh, the influence of the church. This is one of the influences of the growing Christian church, which had uh, certain principles. Uh, one element of, you see, Christian theology as it developed, developed not only with its concept of what Christianity means, but also with its relationship to Judaism. That was very important. And that relationship is a constant in Christian history up to the present day, namely, what is the relationship between the Christians and the Jews when in the history of Christianity, from the time that Christianity became self-defining as a religious faith separate from Judaism, since that time until 1948, there was never a Jewish state in the land of Israel. So in Christian concept and Christian mentality, there is no Jewish state, and church fathers said there will not be, or there cannot be. Well, that creates a certain state of mind and affects Christians in a different way, obviously. And today, the effect of the existence of a Jewish state in the land of Israel has a different impact on Catholics, on what we call Protestants of the main line, and on fundamentalists. They all have a different view as to the significance of this. The church, because of its tradition and its long history of dealing with the world in all of its uh, ramifications, the church reached the conclusion that the state of Israel exists, so we can't deny it, so we'll recognize it in the course of time. It took time, but then the church doesn't move. In, in fits and starts. The church moves gradually, you know. So in the course of time, the church said, sure, the state of Israel exists. We're not going to say it doesn't. Whereas many of the mainline Protestant churches and the Eastern Orthodox churches say the state of Israel must not exist and we'll do everything we can to destroy it, as some of them feel. Fundamentalists are different. They say the state of Israel, wonderful. It's the beginning. The Jews will go back, they'll rebuild the state of Israel, all the Jews will be gathered again to the state of Israel, and then Jesus Christ will come back. No. Don't worry about that. You see, these Jews who worry about that, you know, they say, well, we don't like these fundamentalists because they want us to convert to Christianity. Sure, but don't worry about it. I mean, their thought is, the Jews will come back to the land of Israel, they'll convert to Christianity, and then Jesus will come. Fine. I, I look forward to the coming of Jesus if he comes for a second time. Because, as I tell my Protestant friends, when Jesus comes, I will confront him, we'll carry on a conversation in Hebrew and Jewish Aramaic, and you guys won't understand a word we're saying. <laughs> <laughs> but Jews, you know, Jews, <laughs> when people say Jews are funny and peculiar people, that is absolutely true. Many of our people are strange when they say, oh, I can't stand this Jerry Falwell and this Billy Graham and all those. They, they want us to become Christians. What they want is one thing. What we want is another thing. And when the, the Baptist, Southern Baptist said, uh, we have a goal now to convert the Jews to Christianity, 
And all the leadership of the Jewish community rose up and said, how dare you say that? Well, why shouldn't they say that? This is their faith. A Christian believes it's his duty to convert everyone to, to the faith in Christ. And it's especially his duty to convert Jews because St. Paul said, you know, in the fullness of time, the Jews will come to the point where they will recognize the truth. So they want us to become Christian. Let them want. We shouldn't really get excited about that. The only thing I would say is they may have a certain minimal success with Jews who have never had any Jewish education or background or inspiration. But if Jews teach their children faith in Judaism and it becomes a part of them, then let the Baptists do whatever they want. There were times when not only did they want to convert us, but you know, they did it with the threat of either or. And there were Jews in the, the Rhineland by the thousands in the First Crusade who said, well, I'm not going to accept Christ, and if you cut my throat, that's your business. You know? So, you know, we have many different manifestations of this conflict. It's a one part. Of, it's, these are parts of the whole. Now, in the course of Christian history, there has never been a Jewish state. And therefore, the Christians made a point of it, incorporated it into their theology. Um, as many Christians said, and as Christians believed, and many still believe, that Judaism ended with the coming of Christ. Judaism, once Jesus came, he fulfilled the prophetic uh, visions, Judaism ended as a creative factor in world history. So what are the Jewish people? So then the church fathers debate that issue. And most of them say the Jewish people uh, are sinful because they rejected salvation through Christ. Uh, the Jewish people are condemned uh, by God to eternal damnation because of their rejection of Christ. But we have to preserve the Jewish people as a, an entity, as a people. The physical Jews are our responsibility. This was expressed most emphatically by St. Augustine. I mean, St. Augustine said, we have to protect the Jewish people. They are the people into whom God was incarnated. I mean, God chose to become a Jew when he came to earth to become Jesus Christ. So the Jews are a very important factor. And not only that, they wrote the Old Testament. The fact is, we Christians are Romans and Greeks, but the Jews really know the Hebrew language. The Jews are the, the foundation on which we build the structure of Christianity. So they are our responsibility. We have to preserve the Jewish people. But because they rejected Christ, they're going to suffer, and they will be dominated by the church uh, for all eternity, or until such time as they come to their senses and become Christians. So, but that's interesting, and, and the way uh, St. Augustine also says the Jewish people are a witness to history. It's as if our living presence is a witness to the truth of Christianity. He emphasizes this. On the other hand, you have a contemporary by the name of St. John Chrysostom, who preaches violent vituperation and hatred of the Jews. He is impassioned in his condemnation of the Jews and of those Christians who want to do Jewish things. By the way, at the early centuries, there were many Christians who said, you know, we are Christians, but we came from Judaism, so we should do things according to the Bible, so we'll celebrate Passover on the uh, night of the 14th day of Nisan, which is the Passover. But the Christians decided that Passover should be celebrated on the Sunday of the day of resurrection. So the Christian Passover is on Sunday, and the Jewish Passover is on the 14th of Nisan, which may be on a Friday night or any one of other four days of the week. Well, when Christians wanted to celebrate the Passover on the Jewish date, St. John Chrysostom went wild. He preached eight sermons against the Christians who are observing the Jewish Passover, what he called the Proto-Paschites. Now, Chrysostom is, is passionately anti-Jewish, theologically. I mean, he doesn't say Jews have to be killed, but he says they're just the awful people, these awful people. And he mentions many things about us which are awful. They are, they are rich. They live in luxury. They have too many children. They're 
a lot of other things which are not that important. But nevertheless, he preaches passionately against the Jews. And when he says something and inspires a congregation, and they become all in, uh, inflamed with the hatred of the Jews in reaction to his words, and they rush out of the church and they go over and they start to attack synagogues and attack Jews and, and kill and burn. And the people come to him and say, what did you do this for? He says, I didn't mean that. Well, what did you mean? Well, I was just expressing the truth. Yeah, but look, you inspired people to do this terrible harm. Yeah, but that's not what I wanted them to do. You know, it's, uh, in the Talmud, there is a very important statement. It says, Chachamim hizaharu b'divrechem. It says, if you have any brains, be careful of what you say. Because words are, I mean, this is human power. No other animal has this power. We have the power of speech, and with speech you can kill people. With speech you can, uh, you can annihilate a personality. You can do all terrible things. We've experienced it. We've done it to others. We have suffered because of it. I mean, imagine what happens to a child in school who's a pretty bright kid, and the, kid, the teacher looks at him for some reason and says, you idiot. He fails his exams. I mean, we do many things with our speech. So here comes Chrysostom, and he rails against the Jews. And then when the people take him literally, then he says, well, that's not what I meant. Well, if you have any brains, sir, and you do seem to because you're a brilliant speaker and you're a great theologian, why aren't you careful in what you say? So you see the difference, and these are contemporaries. So you see, Augustine on the one hand says, we have to protect the Jewish people, and Chrysostom says we have to condemn them because they are because they are, essentially, he said, they're seducing the Christians away from the true faith. That was one of his problems. Now then, uh, we come to the rise of Christianity. And Christianity begins to increase in numbers. At a certain point, the Christians really say, we are, we are not Jewish anymore. And they say this for several reasons. The Christians who lived with Jesus, and at his time, and his four brothers, and the other members of his family, all of these people believed that Jesus, although he was killed, would come back to life to establish the kingdom of heaven and earth. These were the original Christians. But they were very religious Orthodox Jews. Very religious. This, this was an extreme group of Jewish sectarians who were very religious and orthodox, and very Jewish. That's why when St. Paul appeared on the scene, they had this discussion, this argument, the debate. And they finally said, OK, go ahead, do what you want to in the Gentile world. Just don't preach here in the Holy Land, in the land of Israel. So essentially, that was the, the split, where St. Paul started his mission in Greece and in Rome and preached and converted the Greeks and the Romans. And others went out to other places. But in the land of Israel, this small group of original Christians, I think the Book of Acts says 120 altogether, this group remained loyal to their Judaism. And they were killed in the uh, destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70. And that was the end of the Jewish Christian group. After that, the Christians are not Jews. They are members of other nations. And therefore, they have the characteristics of Greeks or Romans or Egyptians or Syrians or Phoenicians. They're, they're not Jews. And so they look upon the Jews in a different way. And they look upon Judaism in an entirely different way. And they essentially affirm their Christianity as distinct from Judaism. Originating from it, yes. But we have nothing to do with the Jews. And the Jews are also a nationality, a nation, whereas we are universal. Christianity is universal. We're not interested in nationality. And the fact is, Christianity became the, the faith of many nations. And it became a universal faith. And while Judaism has many universal elements in it, Judaism remained this, the religious conviction of the Jewish people, of the Jewish nation. Now, when it came to the problem of when are we going to rebuild the temple, and that was a real serious problem to the Jews. After all, the temple had been destroyed in 586 BC. In 539 BC, the emperor said, you may rebuild it. Well, the temple was destroyed in the year 70. Let's ask the emperor to 
help us. At least to declare we should rebuild our temple. Time has passed. And uh, the pagan emperors would have said, uh, and, and this, of course, you are a religion. Judaism is recognized religion. Build your temple. The only problem is that Christianity was already militant, existing. And as the Jews said, we want the temple to be rebuilt, the Christians said, don't rebuild the temple. Don't let them rebuild the temple. Because the destruction of the temple was a very significant symbol to Christianity. You know what's interesting? That I, I, Christians approach me and they say, do you think the Jews are going to rebuild the temple? I say, I hope not. <laughs> I don't think so, but I hope not. But uh, why do they ask that question? Because in the Christian mentality over the ages, over the centuries, the destruction of the temple meant the end of effective Judaism. And the symbolic end of Judaism were the burned stones and the timbers on the Temple Mount. I think we're almost up. So when the Jews uh, wanted the temple rebuilt, Christians began to bombard the emperor with demands that he not permit the rebuilding of the temple. And this is what led to the... What year are you talking about? We're talking about the year 125, 120, 125. It started in 117, actually. Uh, this whole... Pardon? At that point, the Jews probably outnumbered the I don't know if they did. I'm not sure. We don't know. All we know is that the Christians were very strong in their expression of their opinions and very militant and very, cons uh, very combative in saying the temple must not be rebuilt. This was very important to the Christians. Yes? I think it's also fair to say that Christianity was persecuted in the Roman Empire up until uh, uh, one or another. Later, later on. Their influence was Excuse me. Sporadic. This was after, after, after Hadrian. After, when, when Hadrian still didn't know the difference between Jews and Christians. After Hadrian, the, the Romans began to say, well, this gang of communists they won't salute the flag. They don't recognize the emperor. They're subversive. If they, if they saluted the flag, they would have been recognized as a religion. But they didn't want to. So this is after Hadrian. Before Hadrian, Hadrian doesn't really know. that Hadrian is not much different from Suetonius. He doesn't know the difference between Jews and Christians. All he knows, these Jews are saying build the temple, and these Jews are saying don't build the temple. Why am I going to get involved in this Jewish conflict? I mean, this was... The emperor's problem was entirely different. He had an empire to deal with. He, had to, he was trying to withdraw troops from England and from other places because he said we we're overextended. He had many problems. This was another one. And it turned out to be that the conflict between the Jews and the Christians on the rebuilding of the temple was something that Hadrian, they bothered him with. And then he said, to hell with it. I don't want to bother with this. No, I won't, I won't rebuild the temple. You know, it's just another business that I don't want to deal with. And this is what started the great problem which led to the Bar Kokhba rebellion. We'll carry on next time. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs>